Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started. So I'm Brian Flanagan. I'm a professor of theology at Marymount University. Um, the rule at Marymount is you have to have the first name Brian in order to teach there. <laughs> and I'm very honored to be moderating our panel this morning on world Christianities, the emergence of a truly global church. Um, and I'll be following the order of speakers that we, you find in your program. So our first speaker is Professor Jose Casanova, uh, one of the world's top scholars in sociology of religion, one of the world's top scholars, period. Uh, professor here in the Departments of Sociology and Theology here at Georgetown University, a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center, um, where his work focuses on globalization, religions, and secularization. This year, 2017, he is the Kluge Chair in Countries and Cultures of the North, at the U.S. Library of Congress's John W. Kluge Center, where he's writing a book on early modern globalization through a Jesuit prism. He's published works on a broad range of other subjects, religion and globalization, migration, religious pluralism, transnational religions, uh, and of course this 1994 book, Public Religions in the Modern World, is a modern classic in the field. It's been translated into numerous languages. Uh, in 2012, Casanova was awarded the Theology Prize from the Salzburger Hochschulwochen uh, in recognition for his lifelong achievement in the field of theology. So we're very happy to have him speaking first this morning on this panel. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Casanova. Thank you very much. It was a big surprise when they gave me a theological prize. I didn't like about any theology in my life. So, uh, uh, I'm just a sociologist, and it's a great honor and a great pleasure to be a sociologist among theologians. Uh, what I'm going to discuss is not so much the legacy already attained by Peter, but the legacy which he's still building right now as we speak, because this guy publishes, probably has about 12 projects on the, on, on the pipeline right now. And one of them is one which I uh, call direct with Peter, which is on Asian Pacific Catholicism and globalization. So what I'm going to do is basically present uh, uh, our project and uh, uh, how we started it and what is, how is it organized. Again, uh, the premise came out of the project on the Jesuits and globalization that we finished uh, through the Berkeley Center. The volume is out. Some people here, David and others, were part of the project. And there we discovered that the three historical phases of the Jesuits, from, from, from foundation to suppression, and then from restoration to the 1960s, the new refoundation with Arupe and Vatican II and liberation theology and so on, actually corresponds to three phases of globalization. Mm -hmm. That when we talk of globalization, and globalization in the literal sense of the world, the globe, mm -hmm. becoming a reality for activities, for interconnectivity, and for, and for human consciousness. And, so there are very three distinct phases of globalization with very different dynamics, very different patterns. And this is through these three different phases that Catholicism has become global in Asia. So precisely when you look at Catholicism in Asia, these three phases are so clearly separate, distinct. Perhaps not so much in the Philippines because there is a clear continuity. It's the only Catholic country uh, uh, in Asia. And the one that follows the model of fusion of military conquest and spiritual conquest, like in Latin America. But in the rest of Asia, with the exception of few towns by the, by the, by the Portuguese, let's say in Goa, Macau, Malacca, there was no spiritual conquest. Mm -hmm. The missionaries went on their own and established a process of intercultural encounters without hegemony. Mm -hmm. It was a process of globalization in Asia before Western hegemony. Mm -hmm. This was the golden age, of course, of global missions. Protestant missions only started almost 300 years later. I mean, there are small uh, outbursts of Quakers and, and, and pieties early on, but really only with the foundation of the London uh, the, the Mission Society in London, 17, 1795, the expansion of global Protestantism really begins. But this is 300 years after the expansion of global Catholicism. So the first phase, of course, of global Catholicism in Asia, but also throughout the globe, is linked to the Iberian phase of expansion, uh, Portuguese and, and Spanish. And it was carried by both by the royal patronage, Portuguese, Padroado Regio, and by the Patronato Real. They divided up the war between the two. The Treaty of Tordesillas, the Pope said, this is the 
uh, imaginary meridian. All the lands to be discovered left of this line are for Spain. All the lands uh, right of this line are for, for Portugal. Of course, nobody else but Spain and Portugal accepted this division. But they actually maintained this division. But once the, port, the Spaniards also came via the Pacific to the Philippines, mm -hmm. a new meridian dividing the East Indies had to take place. And this was the Treaty of Zaragoza 30 years later in 1527. Mm -hmm. So what you have is really this project of both Iberian Catholicism mm -hmm. and then the expansion of missionaries beyond. Of those, of course, the most important in this phase is really the Jesuits. The Jesuits is the first organized group in history to think and to act globally. They are the pioneer globalizers. But precisely not spiritual conquerors. Because when they arrive in Latin America, the spiritual conquest has already been done by the other orders. And now in Asia, when Balignano, when, when Francis Xavier comes to Japan, of course, he's carried by a Portuguese uh, man of war, but then he goes on his own into England, Japan, where the Portuguese cannot go. The same thing with Ricci in China. The same thing with Alexander de Rhodes in Vietnam. And at least this is part of the legacy already of, of Peter Roth, the, the book on Alexander de Rhodes, the uh, uh, French Jesuit that is the first missionary in Vietnam, which not only brought Christianity, but actually brought the Vietnamese script that is being used today by Vietnam, was invented by Rhodes. Because this, it's not only, exactly, it was not so much proselytizing, which is the state here, but the intercultural encounter itself. Uh, and the interesting question is what happens after this first phase comes to an end because they are expelled. The missionaries are once Rome prohibits the, the Chinese rites, the, the, the uh, Confucian Christian synthesis initiated by Ritze had been established in, in, in China. What we see here, especially in the expulsion from China and the conflict between the Pope, the Chinese Emperor, Portugal, and France, the competition of three alternative projects of global Catholicism. You have the three global Catholicism as imperial projects, first the Portuguese and the Spanish, which are in conflict with one another. To this is added the royal. And then each of them sends their Jesuits to their missions. But then the Jesuits go beyond these empires to establish a new type of intercultural relations. And this is what, of course, the method of accommodation, enculturation, which we have rediscovered again in our global cultural age of multiculturalism and, and, and religious pluralism. But this was something which the Jesuits already discovered in China, in Japan, in Vietnam, etc. And it's very important to understand that this method of accommodation was not somehow thought by the Jesuits and the European strategy how to proselytize. It was came out of the pragmatic encounter. Mm -hmm. It was the pragmatic encounter itself. And it was the Christian and Japanese, I mean the Ch Chinese and Japanese Christians that basically told them, look, if you want to have any effect on our culture, you have to behave like us. You have to, to learn our culture, you have to become Japanese. So it was not so much that it was a strategy of proselytizing, but simply a response to this intercultural encounter. So you have the first project I said is the Iberians, or the royal. At the time, the Pope was not interested yet in global missions at all. He was interested in his own uh, royal power in the papal states and fighting uh, uh, more in Europe. But then, of course, the Jesuits already, through the fourth bow of obedience, use the papal universal jurisdiction to become truly a universal missionary order, which of course, yes, was protected and sponsored by the kings, Catholic kings, but had a project of its own. And this is then, out of this conflict, to the conflicts between the Catholic powers, Spain, France, and Portugal, and all of them, and the Jesuits, and the other religious orders, that finally, in 1620, Rome decides to establish a propaganda fide. Mm -hmm. Propaganda fide that is designed to take the missions away from the Catholic kings and from the Jesuits. Uh, later, the Mission Etrangers, the French mission uh, society, will be the, the, the kind of the carrier of this project now of Romanization. Uh, you have now a project of global Romanization through the papacy, through propaganda fide, mm -hmm. that is both in tension with the Iberian global Catholic projects and with the Jesuit mm -hmm. that was a project that had a certain autonomy between the kings and the Pope. Mm -hmm. Now, 
What is interesting is that uh, what happens when the Jesuits are expelled from Japan, and when Japan actually develops its own identity in reaction to the Christian encounter, you know, the so-called Christian century. I mean, Japanese society was radically transformed by this encounter. And in the process of unification, Japan develops a radical new identity in contradistinction to Christianity, has to eradicate any memory of Christianity. But you have underground Christians, Catholics, that for two, 300 years, without priests, without sacraments, without churches, when the second phase of, glo of Catholic globalization arrives in Japan in the 19th century with precisely the French uh, Catholic missionaries, these people underground, the Marranos, Marranos from below, like the old Christians, in the case of the Jews, the new Christians, reemerge. The interest, the paradox is that precisely if the Chinese rights controversy was about accommodation, acculturation, how much of Chinese culture can be Christianized, mm -hmm. the paradox is that precisely the end of this culture of accommodation, uh, the rejection of the cult of the ancestors, which is so central for all Asian cultures, uh, actually Christianity could survive in Asia in China, in Japan, etc., without priests, without churches, because precisely once they became Christians, the cult of the ancestors demanded that they, the son is a Christian and the sons of the sons. So actually it was the very cult of the ancestors that allowed Catholicism to survive either underground or uh, without really linked to, to the West. So this is the first phase of globalization. Important again is to see that here Catholicism in some places, in, in the Americas and in, in um, uh, the Philippines, comes together with spiritual conquest, but not in other places. In Korea, most, most vividly, it comes not even through Western missionaries. It comes through Confucian scholars visiting Beijing, and they are adapting the Christian Confucian uh, 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 synthesis that Ritchie had developed, and you had then the, the Chinese Christian Confucians, and so the, the Korean Confucians become Christians by uh, uh, the process, not the consolidation, but the example of the Chinese Confucians. The second phase. The second phase is the phase of Western hegemony. Mm -hmm. Now truly is the project in which uh, the Western empires, colonies, France, Britain, and it is through British and, uh, and French colonialism, then Catholicism will come back again, or come back, come for the first time, to Asia and now also to Oceania, because now Oceania has been incorporated into the globe. It was the only part of the globe that was not, was not part of the first globalization. And here again, Peter has written on the Vietnamese colonial Catholic Church, and so there is again, a, a, a very clearly that now, you have even the restored Jesuits. Now they are truly the Romanizers. Now they become a global missionary order again, but their first one of Romanization, they have abandoned, they have rejected. It was, they were denied to follow their own method. And now, no accommodation, simply Europeanization. Christianization now means Westernization. You have to adapt all of Christian culture. The important thing, and this was the, the Jesuit experiment, is the understanding that Christianity is universal and can only be universal if it becomes incarnated in its particular culture. In the same way it became incarnated in Greek, Hellenic Christianity, and in Latin, Roman Christianity, it has to become incarnated in Japanese Christianity, in Chinese Christianity, in Vietnamese Christianity, in India, etc. But this was forgotten for the second phase of globalization. This is now the phase where Europe is not only the center of the true religion, Christianity, but also truly the world power economically, politically, culturally, scientifically, and now globalization means truly westernization. And the uh, Catholic missionaries go along with this project. And then we enter into the third phase, I would argue, the 1960s, for our perspective, of course, is the Vatican II. This is the first truly global council in the history of the church. Precisely, it was the, the precondition for it to become a global council was the previous two phases of globalization, but the church would have not yet a global consciousness. It was purely a Roman church trying to Romanize the world. What happens now, bishops coming from all over the world, without contact with one another, spending years together in the council, that they discovered their global common consciousness. 
and perhaps another group, another group more than precise the bishop from Asia. Because Asian Catholicism has been nationalized. Vietnamese Catholicism, Korean Catholicism, Chinese, Japanese, Indian, without contact with one another. It was Vatican II that brought these bishops together, and then out of it comes the Confederation Episcopal or, uh, of uh, uh, Asian Bishops Conferences. And now this will take the uh, 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 key role in creating these pan-Asian Catholic, both networks, but also consciousness. And what is important to realize, of course, is that Asia is the least of Christian continents. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's the Catholic Church that has the most of pan-Asian consciousness in Asia. No other institution throughout Asia has a pan-Asian consciousness and develops the kind of pan-Asian, pan-Pacific networks like the Catholic Church. Despite the fact that other than the Philippines, they may be 1% of the population in Japan, 10-15% in Korea, a few percent in China and India. But so part of our project and we gather 15 scholars of Asian Catholicism from all over Asia, is to reconstruct these three historical phases of migration of Catholicism in Asia, then to discuss how such a small minority religion can play a public role, a role in the public sphere of Asian societies, all of them, and in the public sphere of Asian discourses today on issues of migration, ecology, development, and so on. And finally, it's also the task is to contribute, as, as Peter has done probably more than anybody else, to really to give an Asian face to Christianity and to develop networks of Asian Catholic communities so that truly uh, the church becomes a community of communities at all levels. And one of the big communities, of course, the Asian community, which is not only linked to Rome, but is also linked to other African communities, Latin American communities, etc. And the work of Peter is precisely representative. Perhaps he embodies this third phase of Catholic globalization in Asia and in the world. And we have the final conference for our project. We have the third workshop in Manila. We are having the final conference in Melbourne. And we are going to be blessed by the presence of six to eight archbishops cardinals from Asia to come to discuss also our project and to build this kind of pan-Asian uh, consciousness uh, uh, and networks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dale Irvin, who is the president as well as professor of world Christianity at New York Theological Seminary. Uh, I have a prop as well uh, for him and for our next few speakers who collaborated together on the other Festschrift. Uh, the, for Peter Fon, World Christianity Perspectives and Insights, so available for sale outside. Also available for sale outside is one of uh, uh, Dale's major projects with uh, Scott Sundquist, The History of the World Christian Movement, Volumes 1 and 2, um, which are, if you haven't seen them, they're an important and very helpful uh, text for both teaching and for your own scholarship. Um, over the past decades, Dale has uh, written articles in Christianity Today, Christian Century, the Ecumenical Review, the Journal of Pentecostal Studies. Uh, he's a founding editor of the Journal of World Christianity and is on the editorial board of the Living Pulpit. Uh, he's also interested in ecumenical studies, multi-faith studies, Pentecostalism. He's an ordained minister in the American Baptist Churches USA and a member of the Riverside Church in New York City. And we're very grateful for his presence and words today. Start by saying I'm I'm both honored and delighted to be a part of this program celebrating the work of Peter Fan. I've been a friend of his for many years, decades, and I deeply respect his scholarship. And um, probably I join a whole bunch of you who consider Peter your best friend in the world. <laughs> he has a whole lot of best friends. Peter's scholarship covers an enormous theological range, from earliest Christianity to contemporary culture. Engaging the ecumenical spectrum of Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Pentecostal traditions. Along the way, he's touched constructively on almost every major area of Christian doctrine found in the long tradition, from creation to eschatology. I don't think it's an overstatement to say he's one of the most important and influential theologians of our time, although that would go to his head quickly. Um, but even more important for this designation, I think, is to, is to say that Peter is a world Christian theologian. 
By saying that, I say his work defies easy location. He's at much at home in Rome, as he is in Washington, D.C., or Hong Kong. And while acknowledging that all theologies are grounded in the particular context of their production and reflect a location, he nevertheless has demonstrated that one is never bound to a particular location or theology. Human beings migrate both physically and intellectually, but migration doesn't necessarily er result in the erasure of memory and identity. One of Peter's great contributions to world Christianity has been to study and undertake such migrations physically and intellectually in multiple directions. He's done so while maintaining previous commitments and identities. As a result, he's someone who engages not only in what Thomas Tweed calls crossings, Peter equally embodies Tweed's other kinetic religious movement, that of dwelling. He's someone who simultaneously moves through and inhabits what Arjun Apaduri calls multiple ecumenes, practicing what Nam Su Kim calls cosmopolitan theology. It's in light of being a cosmopolitan theologian at home in several ecumenes that I locate Peter's contribution to the study of world Christianity. He's been a major figure in recent decades bringing about a shift in our thinking about Christianity from it being one thing to being many things. In no small part because of his work, it's becoming more common for many of us to think that there's not something called Christianity spread throughout the world, but there are rather Christianities. It's more than simply a deeper refinement of the historical analysis that sees Christianity as branching off into four major trajectories of Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, and more recently Pentecostal streams as scholars such as David Barrett, Todd Johnson, Doug D Jacobson, and others have argued. But it's also more than the usual regional or continental survey of Christianity. Peter's been able to move us beyond a center periphery model of thinking and getting us to think in more polycentric ways about what we're talking about. This is where I think his greatest contribution to our world, our understanding of world Christianity emerges. In this framework, Christianity without the qualifier, is what happens in the North Atlantic world of Europe and North America, which has directly descended from the Latin European constructs of Christendom and is generally known today as, quote, the West. World Christianity, on the other hand, is often confined to the study of what happens in Asia, Africa, and surprisingly Latin America, given the fact that Latin Americans think of themselves as having a European heritage where the United States, because of its Anglo-Saxon heritage, gets to be in the West, Argentina gets to be in what Stuart Hall calls the rest. That line between the West and the rest, the, 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 the North Atlantic and the rest of the world, that line has been drawn at least since the 16th century, and it correlates with the line drawn between church and mission, or mission lands, Christian lands and mission lands, its deepest roots, its deeper roots, are in the mentality of crusading against heretics and infidels in the Latin West that came to be conceptualized along the geopolitical lines we just heard about as Christianity against Islam, the original clash of, clash of civilizations. Already that divide is in view in the twin summas of Thomas Aquinas. The one being the Summa Contra Gentili, whose purpose was setting forth, quote, the truth that the Catholic faith professes and of setting aside the errors of those who are opposed to it, the contrarios, that is, those who are not Christians, Muslim, Jews, and pagans, and the other, the Summa Theologia, whose purpose was, quote, to propound the things belonging to the Christian way in a way consonant with the education of beginners the incipientium. Taken together, the two summas construct an inside-outside world, an outside-inside world of Christian truth, effectively drawing a boundary line between teaching the contrarians or infidels who are outside and beyond Christendom's pale and those within it who are gentle beginners. Thomas drew no firm territorial lines in making his distinction. The, the contrarians and the infidels to whom his first summa was addressed, were as much within the territorial boundaries of Christendom as they were beyond it. The Reconquista, 
of, Sp of Iberia was still underway as Thomas was composing the Summa Contra Gentiles, as was the crusade against the Qatars in southern France. The territorial divide began to become more clearly into view in the 15th century with the launch of the explorations of the Portuguese ships along the coast of Africa. In his papal bull of 1455, Romanos Pontifex, Nicholas V explicitly identifies the location of knowledge that he and others have. The voyages towards the southern and eastern shores, he said, had exposed an absence of knowledge held by those of us, quote, in the West. We Occidentals, he said, have, quote, no certain knowledge of these other peoples. They are unknown, incognitum. Here we begin to see the contours of Edward Said's Orientalism already taking shape. The 16th century saw that divide between believers and contrarians and the correlating divide between the West and the rest, the South and the East, become that of church and mission. Again, the Jesuits in the 16th century are usually charged with having been guilty of naming this effort directed against outsiders as missions thereby constituting mission as being what is beyond Christendom. Quickly, the nomenclature of church and mission, or church versus mission, took hold. And what happened in the West was church, while what happened in the rest was missions. The church was, by definition, the center of the theological constructed world. Missions, plural, constituted the fragmented or fractured periphery. The church was parent, mission was the child. And in this construction, what we now call world Christianity, too often and too quickly got reduced to being mission studies. Peter's own work has been to challenge that effort, that, that construction of a Christian center and a mission periphery. His argument, especially in the last chapter of The Joy of Religious Pluralism on church and mission, goes a long way to grounding the whole mission and the whole church, or the whole church and the whole mission to the world. Overcoming the hierarchical ordering of church and mission that privileges the former as parent and the latter as child allows for a new configuration to emerge within the field of world Christianity. Peter calls it in his work a communion of communities. The result is a true fellowship that is both grounded in and gives rise to radical practices of mutual love, a phrase that was used by Archbishop William Temple in his enthronement ser sermon in 1942 as he was becoming Archbishop of Canterbury. William Temple wrote, quote, no human agency has planned this new movement. It's the result of the great missionary enterprise of the last 150 years. Almost incidentally, he continued, the great world fellowship has arisen. It is the great new fact of our era. Peter Fan writes, in a nutshell, this new way of being church consists in decentering the church from itself and recentering its mission on serving the reign of God. Archbishop Temple in his enthronement ceremony agreed with him. In that same sermon in 1942, Temple wrote, quote, the New Testament bids us hope for a city of God whose gates are ever open to the four points of the compass so that all may enter and that all nations shall walk by the light of it. We may not hope for the kingdom of God in its completeness here, but we are to pray for its coming and to live now as its citizens. And here we find ourselves belonging to a fellowship which is an early counterpart of the city of God. End of quote. The great world fellowship that is found among the communion of communities, that was the great new fact of our era that Archbishop Temple was talking about. It presupposes both the possibility of multiple ecumenes and of mutual love among them. Temple's theology of fellowship, what I call the dwelling, and the ongoing efforts to look at theologies of missions, which I'll call the crossings, both presuppose different ecumenes as they look forward to communion among them. I think Peter Fan's work has done this, bringing both sides of the insights together as two sides of a single sharp cutting edge, cutting edge an image I draw from Aloysius Pieris. 
and the result is an articulation of an Asian Catholic Church alongside the Roman Catholic Church. Not necessarily replacing it, but also not simply amending it. This is what Aloysius Piaris was calling for when he said a church that is in Asia, of Asia, and not just simply in Asia. In this way, I think Peter and others in his work have effectively helped to bring about what Robin uh, Boyd in 1974 so elegantly termed the Latin captivity of the church. Like Luther, he's brought about an end to an era. But in doing so, this doesn't erase the different ecumenes. It engages in dialogue and interaction between them and among them. It pluralizes the subject. World Christianity is systematic theologies, constructive theologies, church histories, studies that are grounded in multiple and diverse pastoral contexts. At the same time, Peter's picked up this notion of mission and church on six continents, which takes him down to the ground in each place that his work visits. I find in his four dialogues that enliven the series on pluralism and, and, and theology and, and culturation in Asia, among his four dialogues, I have found the most compelling to be the dialogue of life. Culture is not just the soil into which a new pot, a potted plant gets set to grow the same. It is the soil out of which Christianity grows anew and fresh. And what makes this work compelling for me is the manner in which the cosmopolitan theologian has learned to live what Kosaki Koyama called walking with a three mile an hour God down on the ground with people where they are. Sarah Coakley, in her book, God, Sexuality, and the Self, starts at the beginning to note that in her definition, quote, the task of theology is always, if implicitly, implicitly, a recommendation for life. I take the work of this that we're doing with Peter Fan and others in world Christianity to be an extraordinary recommendation for life, but being lived in multiple worlds. Thank you. You get more time. Our next speaker, and again, we have the prop in a moment, uh, is Jonathan Tan. Jonathan is the Archbishop Paul J. Hallinan Professor of Catholic Studies at Case Western Reserve University. He's also an affiliated faculty member of the Ethnic Studies Program at Case Western in the areas of Asian, Asian American Studies and Chinese, Chinese American Studies. He's the author of Introducing Asian American Studies and Christian Mission Among the Peoples of Asia, both from Orbis Books, and is one of the editors of World Christianity Perspectives and Insights Available for Purchase Outside. His numerous essays and book chapters encompass topics and issues in Asian and in Asian American Catholicism, Asian and Asian American Christianity, World Christianity, Interreligious Studies, Liturgical Studies, Migration Studies, Mission Studies, and Chinese Religions. Uh, and he is trained both as a theologian and as a lawyer, so he is perfect for you to invite to a dinner party. <laughs> he holds a Bachelor in Laws with Honors from the National University of Singapore Law School, a Master's from the Graduate Theological Union, and a PhD from the Catholic University of America. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Tan. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak in honor of my Dr. Father, Peter Fan. Now, what I'm going to do today is a bit different. Rather than uh, to regurgitate what everybody has been doing, because everybody knows how great Peter is. So what I'm going to do is to use Peter's work as launching pad. You know, because Peter's work offers a great deal of potential to break new ground. So my presentation today is entitled Between Memory and Imagination. So play on Peter's 1999 essay you know, uh, that you wrote on your experience. The subtitle, Reimagining a World Christianity Without Borders. Three case studies, transient migrants, online and virtual communities, and insider movements. If I can do all these three in 15 minutes, good. If not, at least the first two. So what do we mean about a world Christianity without borders? How would theologizing be impacted when we collaborate with the disciplines of social sciences? And, to, and this year, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, 
You know, when we look at the discipline of the geography of religion, because at the heart of the Protestant Reformation was essentially a changing geography of religion. It was not just theological. The, the whole geology of Europe is changing. So what does that mean? So with that insight, if we look today, the implications of the changing geographies of religion today. Now, I need not rehash the work that's done by professors like David Lay of the University of British Columbia. No. One of my protégés, Justin C., who is now at Northwestern University doing Asian American Christianity, or the work of Professors Brenda Koh and Didier Kong in the National University of Singapore and the Singapore Management University, respectively. So what I'm trying to do today, you know, bringing theology and the discipline of social sciences, how do we map the geographies, the social and virtual geographies of religion generally, and world Christianity in particular? especially if we talk about breaking borders, the borders set by a Eurocentric Christianity. How do we pay attention to developments in the daily life experiences of Christians, including those who are you know, mig migrating, move, moving around the world, uh, you know, in online communities, as well as what the newest uh, group, the insider movements, people who choose in Asia and Africa who choose to follow Jesus while remaining institutionally within their own religious traditions. That's the fastest growing segment of, of followers of Jesus for which traditional ecclesiology have no answer for. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge for world Christianity. Now, for my first part, when we look at transient migrants, so this is a work where I it was uh, done in collaboration with my colleague from uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Gomez uh, from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia, Melbourne, Australia. She was a principal investigator in an uh, Australian Research Council Discovery Grant. Uh, we we want, uh, wanted to explore transient migrants in Singapore and Melbourne across Asia. Now, we have spoken, Professor Hollenbach has spoken on migrants as in refugees and asylum seekers. And for the most part, much of theology has focused on migrants who are refugees and asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. But there's another segment of migration that we have completely ignored, what we call transient migrants. Mm -hmm. These are people who are not looking to stay in a place, but they are usually young professionals, millennials, mm -hmm. and that includes in the US when it has no jobs in Cleveland, they go to San Francisco, that is transient migration, internal or external. What do we do about that? Educated millennial professionals, international students who move to new cities in search of job and educational prospects, and turning to Christianity and online communities as a means of finding meaning, networking, and constructing their own faith and social identities. Now, by virtue of their transience, it means they would not really associate with the church of a particular place because they have a job, a contract, three years here, and then three years in another city. Why do you want to belong to a local congregation? So that leads to big implications. The transient migration is the, one of the prime drivers of world Christianity. So if you're interested, you know, our, our work has been published, so you can read an essay in Critical Cultura, published by Ateneo. So the essay is Christianity as a Culture of Mobility, a Case Study of Asian Transient Migrants in Singapore, Volume 25, 2015. And uh, we have a chapter in Catherine's work that's uh, out of the grant, the Transient, Mi Transient Mobility and Middle Class Identity, Media and Migration in Australia and Singapore, published by Paul Grave this year. And the chapter is Christianity, a culture of transnational mobility. So just to sum up briefly, we look at 202 participants in Singapore and Melbourne, of which 57 in Singapore and 145 in Melbourne. Now, in the, in the, in, because of time, let's just focus on Singapore. Looking at the 57 participants in Singapore, we found that 30 of, uh, 30 of them identified as Christians. Most of them were not Christians, but when they were migrants, they turned to Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, and they formed social networks because uh, they could not fit into the local Singapore population. So we found through our uh, few work in Singapore that they turned to Christianity as a way of coping with everyday life in transients. So to, you know, what Peter's work in the 1999 essay also applies to transient professional migrants. And so 
joining these online groups allowed them to gain a sense of mobility. So uh, many of them joined like WeChat, Weibo, because they are, they are uh, migrants from East Asia. These are young professional Chinese to come to work in Singapore. So and they do not associate with the locals. So we find we found two key findings from these 30 or 57 Singaporeans. Uh, they organized themselves using social media, primarily Weibo, QQ, Run Run, and WeChat. And rather than joining local Singapore churches, they formed their own churches with fellow transient migrants to form a pan-Asian Christian identity. And we found that when they left Singapore to go elsewhere, to Hong Kong, to Sydney, those networks were maintained. Now, these have profound implications for theology that I think most 99% of theologians are not even considering. Now, this ties in with the second group, you know, virtual online community, transient and virtual online communities, and you know, Cardinal Chito Tagle of, of uh, the Archbishop of Manila, he's fond of telling people that the Catholic theologians in Asia have to study online communities. They, all our young people are migrating online. The church has to go online. Theologians have to go online. We go where the people are and don't expect people to come to us. So what does that mean when all these uh, digital natives, the millennials, are moving more and more uh, online into this world? And reinforcing that online migration, being transient migrants. Now, what we studied was transient migrants in uh, Australia and Singapore. But that's not where. You find transient migrants all throughout Asia. If you look at Hong Kong, most Hong Kong Christians are transient migrants, not local Hong Kongers. Walk into any Catholic church or evangelical church. See how many Filipinos and Indians outnumber the native Hong Kongers. Go to Tokyo. Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, Australia, and across the Irish Arab world. You go to Dubai, you go to Saudi Arabia. Uh, John Allen, in an article entitled Catholicism Growing in the Heart of the Muslim World in Boston Globe, March 8, 2014, speaks of the Arab Peninsula is experiencing the most dramatic Catholic growth, fueled by Filipinos and Indians, Sri Lanka, Pakistanis, Koreans, working in the oil industry. These are the engineers who, who work in the oil industry, petroleum, construction, nursing. Just go to Dubai Airport. When I was transiting in Dubai Airport, I heard everyone speaking Tagalog because all the hospitality workers, or the host, nursing, medical, they are all transient professionals who are not there as refugees, who are not, who are not looking to make a living there. They just want to make their money and go home. So the result, uh, according to John Allen, is, you know, you have a Catholic population of around 2.5 million in the Arab Peninsula, and Saudi Arabia alone has 1.5 million Catholics. Now think of that implication for ecclesiology. Saudi Arabia does not allow Catholic church, no priests. So how do you organize? So you have group, at least speaking for Catholics, you know, you find groups like Al Shaddai, the Filipino charismatic group, organize lay cells. Now, how do they do that? Social media. Without social media, there is no church. But what does social media have to say about the task of theologizing, changing the whole concept of ecclesiology? So back again to the geography of religion. We have a, a grounded geography that is a physical building on the land. What if the theology is now virtual? In a place like Saudi Arabia, where you have 1.5 million Catholics, but legally you cannot erect a church. Or take for example, and this is done a few work done by uh, one of my colleagues, and many of you know uh, Ricky Manalo, Filipino American. Uh, he was uh, he was in Dubai uh, doing a work for the the local Catholic church there, and. and you're talking about the largest Catholic parish in the world. It's not in Rome, not in Europe, but St. Mary's Church in Dubai with over 300,000 parishioners officially, but unofficial estimate half a million. You have 35 to 40 masters in 12 languages each weekend, over 80,000 hosts distributed weekly. Uh, if you are interested, I have the, the, the photos that he did on PowerPoint, one of which is Simbang Gabi, no, Simbang Gabi, the Filipino devotion, Christmas yeah. to, in December 2014, there were 
15,000 Filipinos per night going for Simbang Gabi. So they couldn't use the church, which only fit 1,700. They were, they were meeting in the parking lot. So this, in the last ceremonies, you know, this brings me to one of my current online projects, uh, which is looking at Asian American Christians, in particular progressive Asian American Christians, uh, where, and this is many among the evangelicals. Liz Lin of the New Vision House of Studies of City Church San Francisco wrote an essay for the Sort Collective entitled The Loneliness of the Progressive Asian American, which sparked a lot of interest. So she and Lydia So of City Church San Francisco started an online Facebook group called Progressive Asian American Christians, PAAC, of which we have some members here, of which the leader Marshall is there. Uh, it's, 3, 000, it's more than 3,000 strong now. Mm. But what, inter why, what is interesting is Asian American Christians in, in the evangelical world tend to be conservative. So Lydia was just mm. crying, if, what if you are progressive? So out of this one essay, an online community was created of 3,000 members strong. And we have a DC chapter too. And all that within two months. Now, uh, a group of us are, have applied to the Louisville Institute, the Collaborative Inquiry Team grant, which was actually, the application is actually due today, which we want to study this particular group. So based on, on our work in Australia and Singapore, now another team of us, three pastors and three theologians uh, are looking. So uh, Ken, uh, Ken Fong, Lydia, and Liz Lin, uh, from the pastor side, Timothy Singh, Russell Jung, and myself, the three academics, we are going to look at it to to see, based on this empirical data of Asian American evangelical Christians, how do we reimagine ecclesiology, ministry, and ultimately identity formation among a new generation of Asian American Christians? So the data we hope will have profound implications, not just for pastors, but also for theologians as we rethink of you know, world Christianity in Asian America where traditional categories of church, church membership, and Christian faith identity formations may no longer be shaped by what we imported from Europe. Mm -hmm. My third category, two minutes, let me try and do that. Insider movements. If you want a quick, short, dirty uh, uh, summary, you can read Bill Diner's book, Insider Movements, Theological Reflections on New Christian Movement, published by inter -Varsity Press, IVP Academy in 2016. Uh, it's a, much of the work is done by evangelicals because insider movements are the fastest growing segment in Asia and Africa. If you look at the population of Christian, Christianity in Asia, about 7-8% altogether. But we, when you add insider movements, the estimate is 15% double. And insider movements are people who choose to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but choose to remain mm -hmm. institutionally Hindu or Christian. So Islam for, for Christian Muslim in Indonesia or Nigeria or the Chris Bakhtar movement. Now I spoke about the Chris Bakhtar movement in an essay entitled Roman Catholic Charismatic Renewal in Asia Implications and Opportunities in the book co-edited by Vincent Sinan and Amos Young entitled Global Renewal Christianity Spirit and Power Movements Past, Present and Future Volume 1. Uh, one of the common threads of the insider movements, they are essentially renewal Christian, Pentecostal, charismatic, uh, which allows them to break traditional ecclesiological boundaries. So in my essay, I studied the Chris Bakhtar movement. So these are Hindu devotees of, of uh, Jesus Christ <coughs> who choose to remain institutionally Hindu, a movement founded by Father Anil Dev of the Indian Missionary Society of a started out Hindu ashram in Varanasi, so that is a Christian. There, there are both Catholics and Evangelicals who started this movement. So, my time is up. So, if you want, you can, you can come and see me for all the citations. But there, you there you find it. Three major areas inspired by the work of Peter Fan that I think will shape theology for the next mm -hmm. hundred years, where I think it will look very different for our students and our grand students, no longer Eurocentric, but truly world Christian theologizing. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker on the panel today is Antron of the Society of Jesus, the third incarnation. 
um, who is a Catholic priest and assistant professor of historical and systematic theology at the Jesuit School of Theology, the GTU uh, of Santa Clara University now as well, where he teaches core courses in systematic theology and interreligious studies. His research interests include ecclesiology, missiology, interreligious dialogue between Christianity and East Asian religions, theological anthropology, comparative theology, Asian theologies and Christianities, uh, Jesuit mission in East Asia, and healthcare ethics. Um, we've heard the phrase, uh, jack of all trades and master mm -hmm. of none. An is actually master of a number of them, <laughs> holding bachelor's and master's degrees in, in, in electrical engineering, uh, an MA in healthcare ethics and an MPS, as well as an MDiv and a licentiate from the Jesuit School of Theology, uh, as well as a master's in religious studies and PhD from here at Georgetown University. And he brings many of these different disciplines mm -hmm. together in both his thought and work. So we're honored to have him speaking today as well. Also one of the co-editors of World Christianity, Perspectives <laughs> and Insights. Oh. Please join me in welcoming on. Thank you. i be like a homecoming here tonight, I mean this afternoon. And uh, thank you for Gerald to invite me in come back to honor Peter in this work. What I'm about to say more or less uh, is not so much something new, you've probably heard it before, but some of the, the reason I choose this topic about talk about Jesus Christ because that's one of the things that he talked talk about get Peter into trouble when I first started out here at Georgetown in 2006. He was one of his work in being interreligiously uh, being religious interreligiously dealing with the question of the different portrait of Christ and get into trouble with the church. But I'd like to, uh, to think with him, not so much as to repeat his work, but to think about how do we do contextual theology today? Uh, no longer could can comfortably speak about theology as the fide quaeris intellectum. But perhaps today we can talk even in terms of Christology as experience seeking understanding that leads to faith. That's my understanding of how we do Christology. And if that's so, we can speak Christology in the plural term, Christologies, plural. In that sense, the many portraits of Jesus Christ being promoted by many people throughout the two millennia that attempt to articulate the meaningful and relevant in the midst of different cultural and religious contexts. And we all know from our historical study, prior to the 18th century, there's only one Christology that was promoted by the church coming out of Chalcedon formulation to God and to man. And most Western theologies, it's articulation, uh, expansion, contraction of that. But beginning around the Enlightenment time, there was a different approach. Biblical scholar and historical theologists start looking at data and try to reconcile the credo Christology, what professed by the church, with sociological and other data study and trying to looking for different ways to articulate it. Today we take it for granted there are at least four or more portraits of Christ in the New Testament. But for granted, but 100 years ago would not allow so. If you want to conflate everything to one life of Christ, or many lives of Christ you read in the 60s and the 70s. So in terms of contextual Christology, it's not so much new, it's been started about 200 years ago, but now being espoused and become a normative. Most people are not aware of that, and this is promoting like one kind of Christology, where we should talk about multiple Christology. And many contemporary theologians, especially from the so-called the majority world, in the 50s and the 60s, began to dealing with so-called, and Peter Fang can count one of them, the so-called question related to their own cultural religious context. Because Christ was introduced to many people of Asia and Africa, in part of Latin America, is so Eurocentric by missionary, and they want to articulate something on their own. And you can see the development about liberation theology coming out of liberation <coughs> Christology from uh, Latin America, that dealing with the particular social economic inequality. In Africa, people are looking at how to integrate Christ into their own culture. And in Asia, they have to deal in the midst of various cultural and religious parts the Christ we were one among the many others. And in this conversation, also non-Christian join in. We have Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, and other portraits of Christ from different perspectives. So due to the diversity of the many of these Christologies, I beyond my task here to adequately to kind of like treat and evaluate every individual proposal. Instead, I'd like to acknowledge 
the shared interest, the cross conversation, and the mutual influences between the many Christologies from Latin America, Africa, Asia, that have reached beyond their geographical origins and are significant to understand and interpret world Christianity today. And I'm going to categorize various portraits of Jesus Christ from three perspectives of liberation, inculturation, and interreligious. In doing so, I pay tribute to the triple dialogue with the poor, the culture, and the religions of Asia, a theological approach by the Federation of the Federation of Asian Bishop Conference, and a favorite uh, approach of Peter Fan in his trilogy that you've seen that in the past three decades. First, I will go briefly to liberation theology and intuition. Liberation Christology coming out of the experience of trying to focus a shift from a Christology from above, as you know, continental, to a Christology from below, <coughs> dealing with social contact and the work and the life of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, many Latin American theologians like Son Tobrino, Juan Segundo, and other people have portrayed Jesus as the companion of the oppressed and the marginalized, of the key idea. And of course, other parts of the world that inspire feminist theologians in North America and across the globe, uh, black uh, and, Afri and South African uh, liberation Christologies, and even in Korea, we have Minjung Christologies and Dalit Christologies in India, looking at that. So this is a very portrait. And each of these Christologies basically just try to focus on challenging not only social institutions, but looking for transformation in their own context. In North America, they have to deal with racism, uh, sexism. Uh, in India or in Korea, they want to talk about political inclusion or social outcasts and bring it um, inclusion in. The social transformation, they look at Christ as a liberator, not only from material, but also some, from spiritual oppression or some type of spiritual sinfulness that become one of the dominant. That's why you probably look at our, the word like liberation Christology, so many different varieties from different perspectives, including many families. Not only in North America, we have uh, also black uh, womanist and humorista, metiso, and other form of liberation women Christologists. And when we go into the second response of uh, trying to move out far uh, concern of the time here, of the intercultural Christology, people are actually looking for, as has been done in the art. If you actually look at the art, more or less of here, you have post-colonial artists trying to portray just look like a black man or basically Asian person or Indian person or Korean or whatever. You have seen that. But inculturation is more than just remaking Jesus in the image of local people. Theologi theologians today are trying to focus on using native category from the social cultural context to theologize Jesus and to build up their own Christology that integrate and make meaningful of the Christ event in the life of the people. And they're using like, narrative theologies and other symbols and myth, law, folklore, and music and drama to try to portray that. Sometimes not very dogmatic, sometimes very you know, marginalized by the, the other the mainstream. But they explain something that profoundly influenced for their own life. And since family and community are very central to the life of many African, Asian, and Native American and other indigenous population, often you see Jesus will portray like a kinship figure or a leader of the community. For example, in Africa and of course in Asia also, Jesus has been portrayed as someone from a family like an elder brother, a mother, lover. Those are categories that used to express how the relation with Jesus on their own terms. I want to call one particular form here, uh, Jesus an ancestor, which uh, work that uh, started actually not by Peter, but started out by, by African theologian in the 60s. And they're trying to include, be include including the ancestor, a part of their family, somewhat akin to our uh, communion of Saint doctrine, where ancestors now become part of the, the uh, legacy, and Jesus was portrayed as an uh, ancestor by excellence. Peter himself actually wrote an article about this to show Jesus both as an elder brother and an ancestor by excellence and try to fulfill the uh, normative of the Asian uh, filiality. Another portrait very popular also among the African Asian are the biblical image of Jesus as the healer. 
you're very familiar with, you go to Asian contexts and some Caribbean as well as Africa, you say the divine healer or witch doctor, very popular. And they appropriate that image into looking at Jesus. How we look only concerned about the physical illness, but also uh, the Pope who bring the shalom, the wholeness to, to the person in, 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 in concern. And that part of the reason why in recent years Pentecostal movement gained a lot of ground in Africa, Asia, and Latin America because they focus so much on healing. Less of doctrine, but healing. Just very powerful. He can be a healer. He can liberate you all your trouble, both materially, also physically, emotionally. You can get all nine, nine years. Well, one question I have to say that by looking at different metaphors and images so far from cultural element, that can bring many Asian and African closer to Jesus, seeing him as one of their flesh and blood. But each of the metaphor, whether you can talk about him like a mother, or a lover, or a friend, or a liberator, whatever, it's a medical figure in the sense, analog analogical sense. Because these human uh, figures serve as starting point for crystal conversation, but not exhausting. Because viewing from the, this, most of the Catholic like, relational perspective, Perhaps it appeals to the common people whose story and images of Jesus are often told in poetry, songs, and dance. Third, I'd like to come to the so-called inter-religious Christology, which is most controversial. You know, Dominic Jesus coming out in 2000 basically condemned many different understandings of how to appropriate other cultural, not only cultural, but, but religious category, looking at Jesus from this perspective into doing Christology. But dialogue would precisely be because of dialogue member of other religions that enrich the imagination of Christian theologians and allow them to develop Christology that is inspired by the highest ideals of Asian philosophical and religious tradition. At least in Asia, Jesus Christ has been introduced as Avatar and Guru in, in, from India, Bodhisattva and Buddha by the Buddhists, Prophet by the Muslim, Sage by the Confucians, or the Way Tao by the Taoists. Of many of uh, uh, interesting uh, conversation, we can look focus on a few things. For example, from Asia, and for example, for example, many Hindu Catholic will think about Jesus as the avatar of God, one of the many avatars, because it it allow us, to, I mean, Christian to make it to a divine context, human divine context, and. This idea was not thought by Christian thinkers, but first proposed by Hindu thinkers in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, and Catholic, Indian Catholic, and Indian Christian to an extent appropriate that for themselves, so speaking about that one. A point of contact often do comparative uh, religion, that they do comparative between Christ and Krishna. Uh, my friend Thomas Katoy actually offered a course like that in, back in Berkeley. They do Christology. Christ, Krishna, and Buddha. And that's one way, very popular course, and that's how we study Christology today from an interreligious perspective. And they can see some similarity and also some profound difference. In the concept of Avatar, God had become human to make human relationship and the experience of the divine possible. And so the divine can be loved and be served in human form, a human way. So salvation is not mere spiritual and otherworldly, but also humor, human and historical. But the difference also for Christian is Christian do not expect another incarnation of God at this point in history, but they're waiting for the return of Christ. But at least this concept of avatar can be useful to speak of God's desire to be human with the rest of the world and vice versa for the human desire to make God in their own image. Reflective on the image of Jesus and avatar can be fruitful in uh, Hindu Christian dialogue with regard to divine human encounter. Of course, we can also say the same with the image of, God, of uh, Jesus as the Guru, or about Bodhisattva and Buddha. I'd like to wait one minute about uh, Bodhisattva and Buddha, which is a very central Buddhist concept. In Buddhism, the two highest value, value is the compassion, Mahakaruna, and the Mahapranya, the wisdom. And, it, it, and Jesus was seen as the embodiment of the Bodhisattva and Buddha, as a compassion and also an enlightened figure. And Peter Van himself also wrote a piece about that. Jesus is like an enlightened person using Buddhist concept. 
you can go to the Chinese, my friend here have written a very nice piece about Jesus as a crucified sage. Shade is a Confucian concept, the highest ideal of human person. The person who can basically be bridged between the divine and the human world, the three worlds actually, uh, heaven, earth, and human. And the sage one and the body all three. But uh, well, Jonathan talked about Jesus as a sage, but different than other sages. He's a crucified sage. He's the wounded healer. He's the one who basically, from his own life, not just a teacher, but some, so someone who can call people to follow him and to be imitated. And with that, we have to come back to this very last uh, problem that we have to say that uh, I have about 20 seconds, so I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> and I can talk to some more in different uh, ideas. But um, a critical audience, so you know, um, oh. you might complain that, that what I've done so far to present a very portrait is amount to geology. Not Christology, Jesuology. Not a political, um, cultural, religious study of Jesus, rather than offer proper Christologies, those that highlight the salvific role of Jesus Nazareth and God among us. I believe that the dichotomy between Jesus and Christ, or between Jesuology and Christology, is a matter of emphasis. No devout Christian today would deny the various titles given to Christ in the New Testament and in tradition. For example, the Messiah, the Lord, the Son of God, incarnate Word, so on and so forth. But as they are, those are serving like confessional attribution to Jesus by Christian throughout the ages. They tell less about the person whom Christian worship and honor, but more about how they relate to them. So now I'd like to ask you to think and extend this title to include other categories that are meaningful to you, for example, liberator, ancestor, prophet, or even Bodhisattva, Christian and non-Christian today can appropriate Jesus for themselves and make him relevant in their life. So any contemporary uh, theological reflection on the meaning of relevant Jesus Christ, I don't think should be repeating past formulation or credo statement about who he is or what he's done for us. We have done with sociological Christology, we have done with ontological Christology, we have done with functional Christology. Now perhaps we have to think how he transformed our life and also requires us to move forward from dialogue to diapraxis. And not just talking, but diapraxis. So mm -hmm. if it's understood, dialogue is not separation of action. In this similar way, any kind of new development in Christology today must consider both the faith in Jesus, but not only the faith, but also how he live it, and hopefully can bring our life in conformity with that. Devotion to Jesus today implies the imitation of him in all of his life, and death, and resurrection. In such way, we can proclaim Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you.